good. Okay, so, um, right. So I'm gonna talk about scalar implicators again, and uh, I'm gonna introduce quickly the topic by saying that uh, the topic of scalar implicators stems from the seminal work by Paul Grice. And here is an example of a scalar implicator. If you have a speaker uttering a sentence like John danced with some of the girls, some is uh, defined as a scalar trigger and triggers an inference drawn by the addressee uh, that um, entertains an automatic reasoning by which um, he knows that the speaker observes the Gracia maxims, like don't say too much, don't say too little, be informative, be relevant, tell the truth. And he knows that the speaker could have uttered a sentence like, John danced with all of the girls, including all, which is defined as a strong scalar item, and then infers that the speaker uttered the sentence with some because he was not in the position to utter all. He didn't have enough evidence that the sentence with all would be true. Hence, the addressee derives the implicature that John danced with some of the girls, but not all of them. Um, so it excludes the alternative sentence, including all. Why do we know that this is implicature? Because it, it is defeasible, for instance. You can say John danced with some of the girls, in fact, he danced with all of them, it's Saturday night. So it can be canceled without any sense of contradiction. Okay, and this is a scalar implicature. So, after, so I'm gonna try to uh, outline a little bit the, uh, the framework in four slides. Um, so first of all, after Grice's seminal work, his fellows were divided into two big groups, the neo gricians and the post grician also known as relevance theories. And the prediction they made about scalar implicature computation were rather opposite. So the neo gricians said the implicatures are derived by default, uh, relatively effortless in an automatic fashion, and they have a special relationship with grammar. Whereas the post Gricians said that they are only derived, they are supported by the context, that they are effortful, so they, they require some uh, cognitive cost, some, cogn some cognitive computation, and they are completely uh, derived in the domain of pragmatics, so by reasoning and extra linguistic uh, skills. Um, and then, um, Lately, there was an influential work by Kierkegaard, Fox, Fox and Spector, uh, who noticed that actually these scalar triggers and these scalar items interact with the, with the logical properties of the linguistic context. So for instance, you can have weakening implicatures instead of strengthening implicatures, and also they interact with other operators in the sentence, like look at, for instance, the nice paper by Elena. Um, so, uh, in today's, we are gonna talk about the interaction between scalar items and uh, a negative environment. Like if you have a sentence like, for instance, I doubt you'll do all of the assignments, you sort of infer that I believe that you will do some of the assignment. So this is a case of understudied implicature, which has been defined as indirect implicature, okay? So in this slide, you see the difference. Above you have the standard direct implicators, the girl ate some of the cookies, and then you, you, you infer that the girl ate all of the cookies is false, and hence you get the girl ate some, but not all of the cookies. Uh, below you have the indirect implicator. So you have a strong scalar item, all, within the domain of, within um, a negative, under a negative operator, like negation, like didn't. So from the sentence, the girl didn't eat all of the cookies, you infer that the girl ate some of them. Okay, so it's exactly the opposite pattern as direct implications. Okay, now some, some information about um, the timing of the derivation of implicatures, like psycho, psychochronometry of scalar implicatures. So we know from a lot of studies that usually when people judge sentences like some elephants are mammal, uh, which, uh, in, which uh, imply, we sort of convey a pragmatic violation that some elephants are mammal, but not all of them, which contradicts what we know about elephants, then uh, those participants who reject this sentence take more time, um, so their, their response times are higher than the participant that accept this sentence. Hence, they, they, they infer that the scalar implicator derivation is costly. And then in other studies, for instance, by Tom, Tomlinson et al., he saw that people first move their mouths towards a box supporting the some and maybe all meaning, and then they shift it to the some but not all, so infer that the scalar implicator is derived in two steps. And, uh, and finally, there's some debate about, in, uh, with the visual world paradigm and, and, and the eye tracking, about whether scalar implicature derivation is, delay, is delayed in time, as found by, for instance, Wangesnadekar and, 
and uh, other experiments by our group compared to other experiments that found immediate access to the strengthening ligature. Okay, so yeah. I'm gonna skip this. Okay, and uh, and another interesting issue about implicatures is about the, di the diversity. So you have seen from Kajuko's talk that it looks like implicature on, on uh, for instance, on the use of indefinite in certain contexts or plurality implicatures are very strong, but also there is an experiment by Fantier et al. that compared um, scary implications triggered by adjectives uh, compared to some and other quantifiers and he found that within adjectives there is a lot of variability so some are very strong triggers and some are weak trigger triggers and also uh, Kramer and Shemla had this experiment um, with indirect scalar implicator for instance and they found in one experiment that indirect scalar implicators provided an advantage in reaction times compared to scalar implicators so bearing this in mind it's going to be it's gonna be uh, useful to our purposes. Okay, and then what about the acquisition? Uh, so we, we know, we've been knowing for a long time that children struggle with scalar implicators. So they often accept implicator violations, a lot of studies starting from the 70s, and they do not perform uh, in an adult-like fashion until six years, even more, even, even some people claim even 10, 12 years of age. So why? Some people propose that they lack pragmatic competence. Some people propose that they have insufficient processing resources, uh, or, or maybe they have difficulty as associating the scalar items, so associating some with all, and then they do not manage to derive implication. Some interesting, for instance, uh, neuroscientific experiment by Sheetrit et al. found that when they presented children with implicature violation, they activate the same area as adults, which is supposed to uh, be involved in deriving the implicature, this BA47 uh, in, the, um, in the bottom, and which is part of very close to Broca's area, but they lack the activation of another area in the middle front of gyrus, the one on the uh, left top corner, which is supposed to be involved in monitoring a conflict, so monitoring conflicting representation. And so they claim that actually they can derive implicature, but they cannot really uh, compare the strengthened meaning and the non-strengthened meaning to the context, and then therefore they accept the implicature violation. A very, very famous study was this one by, Cash, by Katzas and Bishop in 2011. So uh, they had this kind of context where they had a mouse that wants to pick up some vegetables and there are some pumpkins and some carrots. And then this is the outcome of the context. So the mouse takes all the carrots in the relevant trial and then the caiman um, at the end says, okay, the mouse picked up some of the carrots. And... Um, and the children were asked to say whether the caveman was right or wrong. So a binary typical judgment and 74% of children accepted implicit violations. So again, uh, consistent result. But when they provided children with a ternary, ternary reward, so they could give a, a big strawberry if they did very well, an intermediate strawberry if they did so and so, and a small strawberry if they did uh, worse, then, as it turns out, 87% of children gave the intermediate rewards in the implicature violation trial. So this suggests that they actually are sensitive to the implicature violation. Therefore, they concluded that for some reason that we don't really know, children are more tolerant to pragmatic violation rather than not being able to derive implicatures. Okay. And uh, finally, um, yeah, so let's just some very, very short uh, ideas on the core generation mechanism of implicatures. So again, in the standard framework, uh, it was argued that it's like an extra linguistic pragmatic core, it comes from reasoning. Then in the grammatical theory, it's supposed to be a semantic syntactic core for generating the implicature, like an operator that is inserted in a logical form. And according to probabilistic model, model, the implicature is not really the representation of the meaning, but rather a sort of a mental act uh, through which you grasp the right meaning. So, you know, items like some could be ambiguous between some and not all and some and maybe all. And then you sort of infer in a, in a given context that supports implicature that you have to grasp the some but not all meaning. Okay. And finally, there are some issues about modularity versus interactivity. So there was this very nice example by Giorgio Magri like some Italians come from a warm country. This sentence is very odd because we know that all of Italians <laughs> come from a warm country. And it seems that even if you know that the context uh, 
is like um, it's sort of um, um, you know you, you could fix and, and cancel the implicature taking into the context into consideration but it seems that in this case certain implicatures are kind of the implicature derivation is blind to the context so you cannot adjust the implicature it's always it is always there and it's always disturbing you uh, and then there are a lot of other factors or however there are a lot of factors that interact with implicator computation so uh, for instance priming priming salience of alternatives the order of items the happiness of the participant whether you do it in your first or second language whether you do it in your in your, in your l2 and, you, and how much you've been exposed to your l2 and and all these kind of things so these data suggest that actually implicature are kind of interacting with other subsystem of 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 our linguistic capacity and extra linguistic capacity yeah so right so here's our ongoing project so the way we decided to tackle this uh, this problem was to um, sort of implement um, an experimental design that we called semantic choice task which worked like this basically it's a picture selection task with eye movement recording and i'm going to show you a clear example and the idea is that you can gather offline judgments by the selection of the picture uh, so and also you can explore the over comprehension and link these judgments to the processing um, so you can tease apart certain issues, for instance, about the access of a given interpretation where, versus the preference of this interpretation. And then you can record online movement data. You can explore the time course of the implicatures. And then you can also see which effects happen uh, very, very early and which effects happen later. So how quickly do implicatures affect the target identification? identification? And then you can employ pre-recorded sentences. So you can manipulate the intonation, for instance, and you are going to see that in a second. And you can explore also what is the role of intonation in deriving these implicatures. OK, so here's an example. Um, so we have these stories that were acted out uh, with, with very young participants or uh, recorded on a screen as a stop motion animation. OK, so you have two groups of pirates, the green pirates on the right, the left, the red pirates on the left. And then you have uh, the narrator that says the pirates found the mermaids in this fantastic island who were having a swimming pool party inside the volcano. And you see they're dancing, they're dancing. And then the red captain, the, guy, the, guy, the one on the left, joined the party and danced with the four mermaids in the warm water, while his friends danced with themselves. See, the other red pirates. Whereas the green captain danced with the pirate out of the volcano, while the other pirates danced inside the volcano with the four mermaids. Okay? So after uh, having seen the videos, you were asked to pay attention to the following sentence. And the sentence could be, for instance, the captain did not dance with all of the mermaids. Okay? So this sentence, uh, it is false on the left scenario because there it is dancing with all of the mermaids. Whereas it can be true in the, in the right scenario if you do not derive the implicature because he danced with no mermaids at all. Okay? Right, so the, the, the task was to, um, for children to tell who did better, which group performed better given the command sentence they heard. Was it the, right, was it the red group, the green group? Or if they both perform bad, don't, don't pick any of them. And we know that children can do this also from four years of age because we tested this with much, much younger children. So we know that this task kind of works and that we wanted to use it to explore scalar implicatures. And now I'm going to tell you something about the experimental conditions that we have. So the one that I just showed you is called access to indirect scalar implicature violation. Okay, um, So we call it none condition because the captain is, is, is dancing with none of the mermaids or is interacting with none of the objects. Okay? And, and that is compared to the false scenario on your left where he's actually dancing with all of the mermaids. So when you hear the sentence, the captain didn't dance with all the mermaids, if you derive the implicature, you're, you're supposed not to choose any of the two scenarios. If you don't derive the implicature or if you cancel the implicature, then you're going to ha be happy with the right scenario and you're supposed to never accept the left scenario, right? If you accept the left scenario, it means that you have not understood the sentence. And then we have exactly the same condition for 
the implicature support, which we call null from not all, but some, okay? There you see the captain is dancing with two out of the four mermaids. So he was dancing with not all, but some of the mermaids compared to the false one. So again, if you derive the implicature, then you should be completely fine at picking up the right scenario. But even though you do not derive the implicature, the right scenario is logically compatible. So this is the most, uh, the less restrictive scenario. And then we have the so-called preference condition where we compare the two possibly true scenario, okay? The one violating the implicature on the left, the non-scenario, and the one supporting the implicature on the right. Okay, right, so let's start uh, negation on indirect implicatures and we focus on negation, why? Well, um, first of all, we know that negation increases processing demands. We've been knowing them for, 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 a lot of, um, for quite a long time in a lot of studies. So it, it has a burden on the processing, on the processes of, of, of the sentence. And also we know from some studies that, uh, that employed a dual task. So for instance, you had to keep in memory certain strings or certain numbers or count backwards. We know that if you overload your working memory, then you're gonna obtain a suppression rate of implicatures. So, Negation imposes a processing load. We know the processing load um, um, results in a suppression of implicators. There is a strong expectation that negation is going to interfere with scalar derivation. Okay. Also, we know that children master use of negation already at kind of three years of age. So this is completely fine. And for independent reasons, we are interested in negation, for instance, also twin. In other experiments, we investigate scope ambiguity. Right, so let's come to not all. Uh, not all generates an indirect implicature, okay? We have seen that, but it is not clear what the relevant alternatives are, right? So is it some, the, the right alternative for, for, for not all? The problem that not some is not completely fine in English because some is a PPI, so usually it scopes out of negation. So if you think that you derive an implicature on a string, then using some as alternative could be problematic. A uh, better alternative would be any. So uh, the captain didn't dance with all of the mermaids. It is not true that he didn't dance with any mermaid at all. He danced with some. But then again, why would you have some and all in a positive scale and all and any in a negative scale? That's, uh, that's not sorted out yet. And also, uh, it is also a problem if you, if you think that indirect scale implicature can be lexically derived, uh, because in order to have not all and to activate the, the negative scale, not all and not some, you need all to be composed with not. Otherwise, all will, will remain a strong, a strong scalar item and do not. Um, generate an implicature. So, you know, there are some issues about how, uh, how indirect scalar implicatures can be, can be derived uh, theoretically. And also it is not known uh, how um, in, indirect scalar implicatures are interpreted in children and adults. There are very few studies on this that found basically provided conflicting evidence. So, uh, so we decided to test this. And um, so we employed the semantic choice task with, um, um, eye tracking data, uh, and also we manipulated into different experiments the intonation. So in one experiment, we decided to use an unbiased intonation. So no stress on the, on the quantifier or on negation, just a mild stress on, uh, on the subject and the object, uh, sorry, on the subject and the, and the verb to have it a little bit more natural. So there's something like, the Capitan had mit mit alle mei in Frauen getan. The captain didn't dance with all the mermaids. Um, but then in another experiment, we have a typical neutral biased intonation, natural, sorry, biased intonation that supports the implicature, which involves a stress on a quantifier and a distress of the last part of the sentence. The captain had mit alle Frauen getan. The captain didn't dance with all of the mermaids. Okay, and in Italian it is also quite similar, the intonation contour. Okay, so. Um, just to uh, recap this experiment, we had um, 16 stories, four trials for every condition, access to implicature violation, access to implicature support, preference, and four control trials without negation. And we rotated 16 stories through these four conditions. Um, yeah, and we had 48 German speakers per group, 48 children, and 48 six to 10 year old elementary school children. German speaking, of course, um, right, for each experiment. So we had in total some 200 participants. 
And yeah, and uh, this is the offline results. So the results about their overt choices. Okay, so now we're gonna, we gonna compare the two access condition, null implicature support and none implicature violation. And in the adults, you see that uh, they accept the right scenario uh, very, very often. They make very, very, very few mistakes. And they reject both scenarios very, very rarely in the support, in implicature support condition, but they do it more often in the implicature violation. So you see uh, they have 28% of rejections when the implicature is not supported. And this was completely significant. What about the children? Very, very similar data, okay? So again, they accept more often the implicature support than the implicature violation, right? Uh, the effect is milder compared to adults, so 6 versus 11% of rejection, but the, um, the pattern is very similar. Okay, so high accuracy in both conditions, and in both conditions, you have the superiority effect of implicature support. Interesting. What about the preference? What about when you, when you, when you present both possibly true scenario, one supporting the implicature and one not? Well, the adults have a very strong preference for the implicature, see, 77%, unsurprisingly. Whereas the children, here we split them in two different age ranges, about six year old versus eight year old uh, of average age. And you can see that they have a much, much, much milder preference for the implicature. So 55% to six year olders and 68% eight year older. So you have this nice effect that the preference for the implicature increases as age increases and and this is you know in line with the idea that younger children for some reason tolerate implicature violations okay so um oh, oh, yeah right well, uh, okay so now as you see from switching to this graph to this graph, we are moving to the experiment with the bias intonation. So with the intonation supported implicature. And if you look at the left graph, you see that there is a decrease in the acceptance of the implicature violation. So which shows that, pro that, that the, the manipulation of the intonation worked. So when the intonation stresses um, the implicature, then people accept the implicature less often. And also the children, did the same. So see, they go from 76% to 59%. And even in, in the preference condition, their preference for the implicator is stronger. So it looks at both groups who are sensitive to intonation and the intonation uh, strength and the implicator. Good. So what happens in the online data? So um, now we are gonna now we are gonna look at the, the target preference graph. So if you, if you see the little line on the, on the right, uh, on the right little graph, uh, this is uh, the, the line that depicts the preference for the target, which is the true scenario. So for instance, the non or the null scenario on the right side of the monitor compared to the false. So when you understand the sentence, instead of moving randomly your eyes back and forth from the false to the right scenario, you figure out which one the right scenario is, and then you develop a preference, an online preference for that. When this happens, the target preference line goes up, okay, and departs from chance line. So what we are gonna look at is a lot of lines that grow and depart from chance, and the point at which it is different from chance, it means that participants understood the sentence and developed the preference and for the target and identified the correct reference. So let's see what happens. So this is the first experiment with the unbiased intonation, okay? And you see that surprisingly, uh, so first of all, the green line is always above the, the, the red line, okay? So this means that you have a, an advantage for implicature support instead of implicature violation, over implicature violation. So which is nice, which suggests that actually indirect scale implicators somehow help uh, our participants to identify the target. Uh, but very, very strikingly, you see that children <laughs> were like two seconds faster than adults. So what's going on here? Uh, early disambiguation in children, which is like usually the opposite as what you usually find. And we interpreted this data uh, in saying that, uh, sorry, that, um, that for some reason, children were less, uh, uh, less, uh, in annoyed, less disturbed by this uh, strange, unbiased intonation. 
where adults who are more picky about the intonation of the sentence. So this unbiased intonation in a way interfere with their, with their uh, sentence understanding process. But then in the second experiment, you see that with the natural intonation, things go back to normality. So you have a huge advantage for the implicature calculation. So see now the green line is even, is even uh, there is more distance between the green line and the red line. So uh, much, uh, much more advances for the implicature violation and a comparable latency between children and adults. So now that with the right prosody, we managed to turn adults into children you know, in, in, in a good way. Good. All right, so um, right. So if you compare it to graphs, you see that in the second experiment, the difference is much, much, much larger. Good. If we compare children to adults in the implicature support condition, you see that children, the solid green line here, have a clear advantage at two seconds from the onset of NICT. And in the second experiment, this kind of disappears, and we have, if anything, there is a late advantage for adults. Cool. So, interim conclusion, what, what do we see? Well, we see a systematic advantage for implicature support versus implicature violation, right? So, indirect implicators show a sort of a default-like computation, but less acceptance of violation in adults versus children in the preference condition. Um, so, basically, we see uh, that uh, pra that children are tolerant to pragmatic uh, violations, as found in many many studies, and also that unbiased intonation interferes with target identification much more in adults and children. Okay, so are indirect implicature more robust than scalar implicatures than direct scalar implicatures? That's what we are going to ask um, right now. And uh, in order to address this question, we did exactly the same experiment as with the uh, nicht alle, with not all, employing sum, employ the German sum, which is einige. We use the same pictures, uh, very, very similar sentences, and we employed unbiased intonation. Now, I, I will only show you the data on children because unfortunately we couldn't run any more experiments because of the corona emergency, but hopefully we're gonna be able to finish the experiment with adults and also to, to manipulate the intonation as well, okay? So as you see, the, the contexts are exactly the same, it's just that, for instance, the picture on the left where the captain dances with no mermaids, now it's false, whereas before it was supporting the sentence without implicature. So the sentence would be, the captain has danced with some of the mermaids, okay? And that's, that's supported by the implicature on the right picture, whereas it is violated on the right picture now because he is dancing with all of the mermaids, okay? So again, same trick, same picture, same videos, same conditions, just, just the condition that was, uh, the, the, it was false before now is a scalar implicature violation. Okay, and again, the same trick with preference, scalar implicature support, captain dance with some but not all of the mermaids versus in violation, he dances with all of them. Okay, so let's look at the access first and let's compare what we found now with the previous experiment, okay? And you can immediately see that the, in children, again, elementary school children, six to 10 year old, there is no difference, no difference between implicature support and implicature violation. In fact, in the implicature violation condition, they even, they accepted the target even more often. And if you compare that to the previous experiment, you see that the superiority effect of implicature is vanished. And uh, even more so in the preference condition, no preference whatsoever. Okay, so they, they sort of behave like uh, the youngest children in the first experiment. And uh, yeah, so this is interesting and this uh, in a way raises our interest in the online data, which I'm gonna show you right now. So these are the two ac access condition. The red line is implicator support and the, the blue line is implicator violation. And you see there is a very, very, very little difference. Now, this is only 34 subjects, so it's not a lot of data. We are, we are supposed to have a few, around 50, 48 subjects. So again, uh, take these uh, results with a grain of salt, but the pattern is quite clear. So you see there is very, very little difference, which is completely compatible with what we saw in the offline choices, okay? Right, so almost no difference between scalar implicature violation and scalar implicature support. Does this mean that maybe 
the wrong responses messed up with the data. So we had the same analysis only on the correct responses. Again, very, very similar results. So what, what's going on? Do, don't children compute implicature on some ever? Uh, this, this would be quite strange, right? So what we did was to split our subjects by the, their choice. So we look at the preference condition now and we split the subjects based on those who chose implicature and those who chose the violation of the implicature. And what we find is that uh, you see those who chose the implicature first go looking at the old scenario and then they move at about one second towards the target scenario, supporting the implicature. Those who chose no implicature gradually uh, shifted towards the no implicature scenario. Cool, but is this, can we trust this analysis? Uh, because you know, this is a correlational analysis where we are correlating basically their choice with their behavior. So it might just be the case that those who happen to look at the old scenario and eventually ended up deriving the implicature. So what we did was to look at the distribution of their choices, as Elena mentioned before, right? So here is our nice um, histogram of the of the distribution of the choices. Again, we don't have a lot of a lot of in the preference condition. Okay, so these are all, all the, the average uh, uh, offline choices of the children. So those on the left side, they almost always rejected the implicature and those on the right side they almost always accepted the implicature and those in the middle are kind of 50 50 okay and okay and now we have we don't have many children but you see that you kind of you see the typical bimodal distribution that has been found in many 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 experiments so what we do we do a nice subject split okay so we split the so-called pragmatic responders um, and the logical responders in two different groups and then we go looking at the access condition. So now we want to see what they do, not, on, not in the ambiguous condition, not in the preference condition, but on, in the access condition, when they had to access to the implicature support, so, sorry, to this, to, this, to this ambiguate, the implicature support scenario or the implicature violation scenario against the false one, okay? And we see this if, if, their, if their behavior is different. Uh, so do pragmatic responders compute the implicators on the fly? Do we, see any, do we see any sign of implicator computation? Here's the question that we are really interested in. Uh, right. And, uh, and this is 12 out of 34 subjects, the strong pragmatic responders. And then again, red line, implicator support, blue line, implicator violation. And you finally see that there is a steep increase in their looks to the target. And again, we find the nice um, superiority effect of scalar implicator support. So this suggests that yes, at least a subset of our children uh, derived the implicature and they did it so on fly, right? And if you compare all the, all the children to all the, only the pragmatic responders, the difference is quite clear. So you see, you clearly see that they behave in a different way and that they, and they have this strong, 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 um, steep increase to looks at the right, uh, at the, at the implicator support scenario. Okay, then again, we can, come, I'm gonna skip this one because it's kind of late. Right, so, um, but one might say, yeah, but you know, uh, if you're really comparing scalar uh, direct to indirect implicature, then, uh, then you are gonna probably find the same effect also, if you do the same kind of analysis, so if you split those who always uh, prefer the implicature and to do, with those who did not prefer the implicature, and then you look at the other condition. And that's what, what, what I did. So first of all, in the, with not all, we didn't have a my model distribution. We have a completely uh, nice Gaussian distribution, Gaussian distribution. So again, we did the split, but it was not so well motivated. But then you see a similar, um, you see, you see a similar effect. So they also, also the pragmatic responders with indirect implicature show a nice preference for the implicature at about one second from Nick. However, if you look at closely in the scalar implicature, in the direct scalar implicature experiment, they have this nice immediate um, 
superiority uh, advantage effect for the implicature violation. So uh, in the implicature violation, you have that the blue line is significantly above the red line, and then you have an inversion of the line. And this, in a way, remembers what other people found when uh, people look at the a participant look at the old scenario before looking at the sum but not all scenario or the mouse tracking effect that I showed you and kind of supports the idea that you know that that when you derive sum but not all you first go looking at all and then and then you go to look at the sum but not all picture whereas in the violation condition the effect is completely swapped again we have very few children so we cannot draw strong conclusion but I'm just going to give you some hints about what might be going on. So, to conclude, yes, we found that indirect scalar implicators are very robust and very fast. And it seems that children seem to compute them by default, and adults too, but only if they are supported by intonation. And then uh, we found confirmation of the tolerance uh, of children for scalar implicator, and also uh, that. Scalar implicature, typical scalar implicature, are much less robust and much less fast than indirect scalar implicature. So we found that only one third of children consistently derive them in, the, in online processing. And when they do so, they show a processing delay compared to how indirect implicatures are computed. So in a way, this pattern of looking to all before looking to some but not all confirms the conjecture of the two steps or that all, in a way, helps the derivation of some, but not all. And also that there is a bimodal preference, a bimodal split in the pragmatic behavior of our children, coherent with what a lot of people found over and over and over in other experiments. So back to the theory. What can the difference between scalar and indirect scalar implicature can tell us about the architecture of the system? Well, that some implicatures seem to be computed by default. Indirect scalar implicators seems to be computed very, very early and very, very systematically. And maybe some are bad, are bad example of scalar implicator, those who are derived by some. And some implicators are also extremely fast, again, the indirect scalar implicators, whereas those who introduced by some seem to be more costly and slower. And then we found confirmation that actually young children possess competence for deriving scalar implicator, at least for certain triggers and that they are less susceptible to incongruent intonation, right? And to conclude, we, we, we might actually say that the scalar system interacts dramatically with other linguistic modalities like, for instance, intonation, right? So yeah, so in the implicature core generation mechanism, we don't want to speculate too much about what it could be, but it must have access to compositional information. Okay, so, to conclude, why are indirect scalar implicators so strong, so surprisingly strong? We don't really know, but one conjecture uh, comes from, the, from, from, from this observation. So if you look at the alternatives that you need to derive some but not all, you utter some and you need to activate all. But if you have uh, a sentence that includes negation taking scope over null, it's like not all, then your alternative can immediately um, achieved by switching the order at the, logic, at the logical level between the negation operator and the universal quantifier. So basically, you do, you do not need to, to add another operator um, to, the, to the play, basically. You just have to swap the order of the two operators. So maybe, maybe this is the reason. Maybe their alternatives are always active. But yeah, more research is needed to investigate this issue. So I want to thank my collaborator and my assistants, and also thank you for the attention. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for this extremely rich and thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I think I will have to watch the recording of this presentation again because there was really quite a lot <laughs> for me to take in. But um, my hat goes off to you and uh, your um, uh, colleagues for carrying out such inspiring work. Uh, let's see if there are questions from the audience. 
please um, indicate that you want to speak up by using the chat function. Yeah, let, let me sorry, just, just add, uh, yes. especially to the students that I will share the slides. So I'm going to okay. send you the link or, uh, so then they can go through the slides if, because oh, thank you so yeah, much. It was, it was yeah. kind of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Yeah. And um, I, I will need them too. <laughs> okay. So are there questions or comments? Italian is fine, of course. Uh, I, I don't know if I see something here. Oh no, that's, those are old uh, comments. Yes, okay. So I think uh, Irene, uh, yes. Yeah, that's me. Speak. Okay, please. <laughs> so thanks, Daniele. My question is quite simple. Are you planning to use biased intonation for also for uh, scalar implicatures? Yes, absolutely, yes. So that would complete the whole picture. And yeah, you know, the problem is that it's not easy to, uh, to ask people to <laughs> stand in front of an, an eye tracker in this kind of time. So we'll probably put them a mask on, on them. But yeah, that, that would complete the picture. And uh, what are we going to expect to see? Uh, probably intonation is going gonna, is gonna to strengthen the effect of the implicature. And probably intonation is going um, is gonna to make... Uh, a lot of more children to be pragmatic responders. That's what I expect. But then, you know, I was expecting a lot of wrong things in this experiment. So, I mean, things that actually turn out to be different from my expectations. Yeah. Yeah. But, but how would you create uh, the two conditions? I mean, the neutral, let's say, and the, and the other one. Mm -hmm. So this experiment was already the, the neutral, uh, unbiased intonation, right? Because yeah, yeah, exactly, not... exactly. But I don't understand how you can make the biased intonation. Work. Oh, it's it's how? very simple. You just put stress on on Einige, stress on the on the scalar item. Ah, okay, just uh, by yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. So you just yeah you just use the same picture, same stories, same everything. You re-record the sentences, possibly keeping the same. Uh, the same pace, uh, so then you can compare directly the two experiments. And instead of saying, uh, I don't know, the boy ate some of the oranges, you, you say the boy ate some of the oranges. Okay. Then you know, it's tricky to decide how much stress you can put, because if it's too much, then it's really kind of weird, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think a, you know, a normal amount of stress will be... You know, and you know, is it, and sorry? Is, is it like the, the usual uh, stress you put in this um, in, in this sum? Because in some way it sounds to me something like focused. And then you enter into a different world. <laughs> right, but that's, that's exactly the point, right? So some people like Gennaro, for instance, Gennaro Kerkia claim that it is as if scalar triggers are always on focus especially when you think about numerals, you know, there's a big, big debate that, that we've worked on, whether numerals, derive, numerals give rise to scalar implicators, whether the exact two meaning is derived to a scalar implicature. And the nice thing about numerals is seeing that they, you get the exact meaning even if you do not stress them. But with some, things might be a little bit different, right? Uh, but then, you know, there are a lot of issues. Like for instance, it seems that at least for adults, even if it's not stressed, even if you don't have focus on some, then in certain experiments, they, pre they have a strong preference for the implicature, right? So it, we might find a sort of uh, uh, like a dissociation between what they do with indirect implicatures and what they do with, uh, with the direct implicatures. But I, I don't know, but definitely I'm, I'm very, very curious to look into that. Okay, maybe there is another, wait, um, ah, yes, Francesca. Yeah, I was wondering, yeah. I was yeah. wondering <laughs> if I wouldn't get a question from Francesca today. Oh, Daniele! <laughs> Ciao, Francesca. <laughs> so, probably I already 
uh, ask you that question, but I just don't remember because I'm getting too old. So it, it's about the, the, the preference condition, right? So because uh, the, the, the child can choose one picture, the other picture, or reject. But you don't have the both uh, button picture. Mm -hmm. So um, were the item, item randomized? So did you get mm -hmm. an effect? Because I was thinking that maybe it's too complicated but in a way if you are uh, in a task in which you have to choose one option right left or reject and then maybe you are one who does not compute implicature so in that case both of them are okay for you yeah yeah, so I mean, I agree with you, like usually I, I, I don't even show the graphs of the preference condition because for, for us, the, 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 um, the aim of the preference condition was really to test the, the offline choices because that's a typical thing that you would do in, in a true value judgment experiment, for instance, or in a picture selection task. In a picture true. selection yeah, task. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but uh, so what, uh, you know, what, what I would say is that uh, these, the, the online data on the preference condition are telling insofar as there is a strong preference. If there is not a strong preference, you don't really know what's going on. But if there is a strong preference, that really suggests that the strong preference led you choose the implicator support scenario. So like, uh, you know, why... Um, why else would you choose it? And then you might say, like, you know, like what Jesse Snedeker told me the first time that I presented this kind of experiments. They were like, yeah, but maybe people just prefer the context where the pirate dances with two mermaids rather than the context where the pirates dance it with yeah, all the of them. The point is that, right. that it, so the, 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 the guys who use a picture selection task, uh, they were saying that once you present, so the, the context of the pragmaticist, the one who got on the dark mm -hmm. side, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so if the all alternative is made relevant, right, they should choose, uh, the, 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 they, su they should compute the scalar implicature, right? Because these pragmatists, neo um not, not neo gricean post gricean say that my, maybe children have problems in pragmatic reasoning because the alternatives are not enough relevance but then you show them the alternative so there is all uh, the girls some of the girls so the the all the girls alternative should it's there it's very relevant so they should be able to compute the implicator but you find that pretty old children like six to eight Mm, ten, that, ten, even ten. Even ten. So, but even but ten. then you, so you you are collecting data, right? So you don't have enough. To... Yeah. So I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. It's it's kind of a mystery. Um, it does not really surprise me because we had this condition in the experiment of scope ambiguity that that I presented to you like years ago. So just as a control condition, right? And in that experiment, we had adults control as well. And they went like 80% for the implicature in the, in the preference. So that's what I'm going to expect for this experiment, like a complete, complete split between children and adults. In that experiment, we had four to five-year-old children, so much, much younger children. And we found that they had a preference of like 60% for the all scenario. So quite similar to this one. So when I'm going to have more data, I'm going to do the, you know, the same trick of, of, uh, of doing a, 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 you know, an age group split. But what I, so my, my hands was that when you have to, to, to judge two scenarios where only one is possibly true, then in a way it, it is really kind of a different, uh, I, mean, I don't want to say that you use different processes, but there is really something much, much different going on. And when you have to decide between two scenarios that are both true, then, then you, have a, you have a lot of things, you know, interfering, like reasoning, uh, like your pragmatic tolerance and these kind of things. I don't want to say that, that children always compute implicators and then, you know, and then at some point they are, they are puzzled in deciding. But 
I think there are two, really two things, uh, two sort of forces competing every time we do online experiments and also in offline experiments. And one is really what happens, you know, in real time, as soon as you hear words. And the other one is after you hear the sentence, then you, you think about which one is the right, is the more appropriate choice. And I think children really struggle on the second, on the second, uh, on the second thing. But yeah, who knows? Thanks. Um, okay, then we have um, one and a half questions coming from Elena. Please, Elena. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Daniele, <laughs> hey, one uh, one question. Uh, uh, I think it's a bit silly, but uh, uh, I ask you. So, uh, do you make sure that kids understand who is the captain? Because uh, I have seen these pictures uh, uh, more than once. I mean, it's not the first time I hear this talk, and I always uh, struggle in finding out who is the captain. So the first part, you mean, of the talk. The last part, I <laughs> analyzed the data like last week, so it's impossible you have seen it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, I know, I know. I should, have, I should have explained this. So, yeah, so when you see the real experiment, you know, in a large monitor, you see all the development of the stories, which are actually quite long. So you have a cl very, very clear idea of who the captain is and who the other pirates are also the captain is he has the sort of it has a black coat so it's also visually very very salient compared to the other pirates and then in the in the unfolding of the story um at some point the captain you know gets lost and so and so you see the, what happens to the captain and you see what so it's very very salient and this is also something that should have stressed so the idea of having this whole story-like narration, really like true value judgment task, especially we put a lot of effort in uh, highlighting the alternatives every, every time. So we said like, for instance, the captain uh, saw the mermaids in the swimming pool. He thought about, you know, dancing with them, but then he saw his friend there alone and then he went to the friend alone. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as you know, it's very important that the alternatives are salient in order to, in order for, for children to compute the implicatures. So before I run the experiment on Sam, I thought that maybe the strong results we got with indirect implicatures were not due to the fact that indirect implicatures are much, much stronger, but to the fact that we really implemented, you know, a nice experiment that would really, really push our subjects to do implicature. And then I got this 50-50% of, of preference and I was like, yeah, okay, you know, it's always the same. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thank you. And now I ask your uh, my other uh, uh, question. The bad uh, one. No, no, the first one was the bad one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, the second one is about the alternative. So I don't, uh, I'm not sure I understood uh, properly, but in the first part of the talk, you mentioned that, uh, uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned about the possible alternatives for not all. Right. So uh, you think that for not all the alternatives should be different, right? Then yeah. Well, yeah. So, so I mean, there I is this like problem. Here. Yeah. So there is this problem also in Italian, and I would like to know what you think about that. Uh, so you know, in the in the in the lexical alternative story, basically you derive some some but not all, or sometimes but not always, or can but not must, and so on and so forth. You have the trigger, right? And you. You, in a way, when you see the trigger, then you automatically activate its scale mates, right? And then you derive your implicature. With indirect implicature, this cannot go, let's say, completely in parallel, because, for instance, if you say, John didn't eat uh, every cupcake, right? Um, so first of all, there is no such a not every item. So you have to combine not and every. So, like Neo Grisens talked about, like uh, negative scales or the scale reversal. So you might say, okay, you have your sum and all scale. You have negation. When you apply negation, you just switch the scale. But then, if you have as, a, as alternative, uh, John did not eat some of the cupcakes. Right? That's not good because some is a PPI in English. So that would mean that there are some of the cupcakes that John didn't eat. Didn't eat. It doesn't mean 
that John didn't eat any of the cupcakes that, or John ate none of the cupcakes, right? So you see the problem. Either you use, I mean, there is a way to, to there are a lot of ways to get around this problem. For instance, you might say, sum is not a PPI in ellipsis, for instance, right? Therefore, at the logical, at the logical form level, if there is any, right, then you don't have this PPI hood problem. This is one of the problems. The other way to, to get around this is to say, uh, uh, you know, you might have one scale for, for a positive case and another scale for the negative case. But the, the, you know, the simple idea of activating the one scale made that it's going to give you an alternative cannot work flawlessly, right? Uh, you need some additional assumptions. Uh, so yeah please let me know what you think about this in the future or yeah we'll think about it thank you okay okay we also have a question from kazuko please if you can unmute your microphone yeah. yes okay, okay. Um, so the adults there was a difference between adults and children when the intern so the child adults were more in some ways so more sensitive to the intonation do you is it because children are not sensitive or is it because they they just ignore so they are to tolerant about this than adults so can you actually right. make a distinction between these yeah so this is this is a question that we ask ourselves before running the, the the experiment with the manipulation of the intonation let me just sorry go to the right slide uh, right. So we were wondering, right? So some people even claim in the literature uh, that children are not sensitive to intonation, right? Uh, but then in recent recent results, like for instance, I think uh, some experiments by by Krista, Zendroy, and other people show that actually, she, and also your, I think in your experiments you also found yes. the intonation, right? Right. right? So I was I was worried about this. Uh, but then, so then we do the experiment with the bias intonation. So then, then it's really clear, right? I mean, it's, we can make a very clear prediction. If they are not sensitive to intonation, you shouldn't find any, any you shouldn't find any difference between, right. uh, between the two experiments. And what we found is actually ah. in the adults, you see there is this big, big difference. But even with the children, right. in the online data, there is, there is a quite a strong yeah. difference. So I think we can, safely claim that children are sensitive to intonation right so we must we must interpret the uh, the weird behavior of our adults in some other way maybe they were drunk when they came to my experiment <laughs> or maybe this kind of strange uh, intonation pattern that we used right uh, activated in in their in their mind different uh, different strange mm -hmm. operations like topicalization or uh, or, or things like this, and so and this and this in, this other inference that they might have derived were completely incongruent with uh, the pictures and with the task. Right. For instance, if right. the sentence were the captain didn't dance with all the mermaids, then they might think, okay, there is a topic accent on the captain. So if the captain didn't do that, who did that? There is no right. one else here, right? So that that's one of the reason why why they might have behaved in this kind of a weird way. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, we we cannot. Re so another option is that I haven't said that, but in this experiment, the sentences were longer, so we're much much slower. The pace was slower, so we shortened them up a little bit. And mm -hmm. maybe adults are also bothered by by this very very slow pace. I don't mm -hmm. think that that that's a you know that's a real reason. But but yeah, we, it would be nice to to explore this 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 effect further. Yeah, but yeah, I would I would completely conclude that children are sensitive to intonation. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. They're just less <laughs> less less annoyed by incongruity. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay, so I don't think that anyone else has any comments to make at this point. Uh, so maybe we can call it a day and thank our speakers once again and remind thank you. Uh, no, no, thank you because I mean, you, you took the time to be here with us uh, in virtual space and to you know, devote some uh, time to preparing for your talks. Um, we do not take um, you know, all of this for granted. We really appreciate it. 
Uh, we would like to remind everyone that there is a second part to this uh, seminar, which is going to take place tomorrow. Uh, same place, but not same time, okay? You have all the information on the flyer, the poster for the event, and with uh, two other speakers. And we hope to see you all there as well. So, okay, just a reminder to the students, you should have sent to your name, surname, and student ID number to Professor San Felici, okay, for administrative purposes. And um, I don't know, um, Elena, Emanuela, have you got things you want to add at this point? No, just, just another thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And uh, thank you also, Francesca, that uh, took uh, actively part also today. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, for the students, uh, we can say that we will uh, upload the video, no, Emma? Yeah. As we usually do, it will take more time, maybe because we are uh, recording uh, in uh, one hour. Yes. Exactly. So we don't know how many hours, uh, how many days it will take. <laughs> but they will arrive. Exactly. Okay, so uh, thank you both for this as well. And... Um, Okay, so let's say class dismissed. Okay, <laughs> goodbye and uh, keep right. safe and healthy, all of you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> Thank you very Bye. much. Until Bye. tomorrow. Bye. Okay, goodbye. Ciao, Daniela. Ciao, Daniela. Domani. Grazie. Ciao. Grazie a te. Ciao, Sara. Ciao, Emma. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. 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 <laughs> ciao, ciao. Ci vediamo domani. A domani. Sì. Ciao, ciao. Eh. Bisogna interrompere la registrazione. Sì, faccio end. Adesso no. faccio ufficialmente.